A special welcome to our guests and visitors today. It's always a pleasure to have you. We continue with our theme, the need for followership. Uh, followers of Christ make selfish sac selfless sacrifices. So as we, as people of God, we are not isolated people, but God has encouraged us to love our neighbor as ourself and to have a relationship with him. And what a pleasure it is that we do get to do that, but we may have to sacrifice ourselves in our service to others. We ask God to bless our worship today and we begin with our opening hymn. Please stand. We begin today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, you are the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, for it is evening, and the day is almost done. Let your light scatter the darkness. Let it shine in our hearts and lives. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, and in our deeds, and in all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver and restore us, that we may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we have been bought back from sin, death, and hell by the perfect life and innocent death of Jesus Christ. In him we are forgiven. Let us rest in his peace until the rising of the sun when we shall serve him in newness of life. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, it is only by your gift of grace that we come into your presence and offer true and faithful service. Grant that our worship on earth may always be pleasing to you and in the life to come, Give us the fulfillment of what you have promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We'll join in reading the psalm today, Psalm 62a. Uh, I'll invite you to say the refrain and I'll say the lines. So every time the refrain pops up, uh, you'll say that with me. 
So we'll join in starting with the refrain. In God alone my soul can find rest and peace. In God my peace and joy. Only in God my soul can find its rest. Find its rest and peace. Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from Him. Truly He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from Him. In God alone my soul can find rest and peace. In God my peace and joy. Only in God my soul can find its rest, find its rest and peace. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. We'll join in the glory be. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In God alone my soul can find rest and peace. In God my peace and joy. Only in God my soul can find its rest. Find its rest and peace. The first reading for today is Isaiah chapter 53, verses 10 to 12. The prophet Isaiah foretold that the coming Messiah would make the ultimate sacrifice to pay for our sins. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life and an offering for sin, he will see his offering and proclaim his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong." because he pours out his life unto death and, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading for today is 1 Corinthians chapter 9 with selected verses. This will serve as our sermon text for today. St. Paul shares his willingness to make great sacrifices in his effort to share the gospel of Christ. Who serves as a servant soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? Do I say this merely on human authority? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. It is about oxen that God is concerned. Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because whoever plows and threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, it is too much if we reap a material harvest from you. If others have the right of support from you, Shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone. To win as many as possible to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law though I myself may am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak, 
to, the win, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, then I may share in its blessing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. We join in saying that together. Alleluia. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Alleluia. The gospel reading for today is Mark chapter 10, verses 32 to 45. To the disciples who sought glory and honor, Jesus taught that his followers would make selfless sacrifices for others, just as he would be sacrificed for our sins. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to them. We are going to up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him? Three days later he will rise. Then James and John, the son of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptizing with? baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Him we have life and forgiveness. In Him He is always by our side as we serve others, as we sacrifice ourselves for Him. Amen. I don't know about you, but as I kind of observe society and how it functions, it feels like it's becoming more and more secluded. Don't believe me? <laughs> Just go outside on the road and see how many kids are playing outside in the front yard or how many neighbors are talking outside with one another. It seems like it's getting less and less. You think about how the world even functions in a sense of when adults or kids are out, you often see them looking at their phones no matter their age, and hardly conversing with the people in front of them. You, you can go to the grocery store and order your stuff in advance, and they can bring it to your trunk, and you don't even have to talk to them. You, you can go to Amazon and order stuff to your house, and you don't even have to leave your house. You can go to McDonald's and order your, your burger and fries from your phone, or go to a machine and order it, and have it just kind of dropped off and hardly communicate with anyone. This is the world that we live in, a world where there's not much conversing or kind of interacting with other people. And the problem with that also is that 
you have this issue of kind of becoming self-focused because you're, you're not really talking to other people. You only become concerned about what you want and what you think in, in your own little world. And this can have serious consequences, can it not? You think about people who struggle to, you know, communicate back and forth, right? Maybe younger people are having issues of trying to communicate with the opposite sex. You know, having these conversations when there's disagreements, right? You, you need to learn these things in our lives. You have to kind of get out of your bubble and get a little uncomfortable when we interact with other people. You know, God didn't make us to be isolated. God didn't make us to live in little bubbles where we didn't interact with people. No. He made us to love Him, to have a relationship with Him, but also with others as well. And so as we think about our relationship and relationships in this world, we want to interact with, with people because we want to tell others about Jesus. And sometimes that might mean sacrificing ourselves. It might be denying ourselves as we walk in the Lord so that we can have conversations with people. So you, you kind of think about this. You know, being a, a believer means, again, being interacted with others, right? Worship is not an individual thing, but it's a collective thing, is it not? You, you think, you know, God didn't say where one person gathers together, no. He said, for where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. You know, God designed us to gather together, to communicate with one another, to worship him, to have relationships with him and all of those uh, around us. But you think about, you know, our, our setting or as a church, you have a lot of people. And when you deal with people, you have a lot of different uh, maybe opinions. <laughs> you might have a lot of different thoughts. You have a lot of different backgrounds and walks of life that are coming together to worship and serve the Lord. And as people do that, is it easy? No, it's not. You know, could it be easier just to be kind of isolated? Maybe. But does it serve the, the bigger purpose if we are isolated and don't talk to those around us? It really doesn't serve anyone well. So as Christians, you know, we, again, we have all these walks of life, people who have come from different states. We have people that have come from different countries in our churches. We have people who are lifelong learners of the Bible and believers and people who have just come to the faith. So as we interact, you know, kind of how are we going to do this? What will it look like? And I, I think that's a, a good question to think about. You know, can essentially, maybe you can think about it this way. Can you talk to somebody the same way that you talk to another person? I don't know about you, but my conversations vary depending on who I talk to, right? One person, I might talk about hunting and fishing. Uh, another person, I might talk about cooking, right? One person might not be in, into politics, and so I, I, I definitely make sure I don't talk about politics, Another person might be very sensitive to what you say, and so what do you do? You walk on eggshells around them, right? You kind of have to know who you're working with and who you're conversing with. And again, is this easy? No, it's not. It takes time, doesn't it? It takes time learning and maybe sometimes failing, right? But when we're thinking about the Christian conversations that we have with people, we have a lot of different people that we want to share Jesus with, right? And I want to make it perfectly clear right now. No matter their background, no matter their walk of life, we never change the truth of Scripture. The Scriptures always stay true, and we always say it because that's what people need to hear, Okay? You know, we're not compromising it because, you know, this is, they're coming from a different background. They might not receive this well, right? No. God's word is truth, and we need to tell people that truth. But when we interact with believers, when we uh, interact with the unbelieving world, yes, we still tell the truth, we still tell the word of God, but we tailor it in a way that they can understand. Maybe they can relate to, right? 
Maybe you can understand it this way again. You know, if, if I'm in the country, right, and I'm not going to say the same things that I might to someone in the city. <laughs> or if someone's from a different ethnic background, I might need to communicate differently than I would from people in Abrams or Acanto or Acanto Falls, right? I think we kind of understand this concept. There's a lot of factors that go into our, our witnessing of Jesus. Again, think about Paul in his letters, right? He, he, he wrote to these people, he still wrote the truth, but he tailored it to his audience, did he not? You think about the, the letter to the Romans, is that not different than the letter to the Ephesians? Is that the Ephesians letter not different than the letter to the Philippians? Is the Philippians letter not different than the letter to the Corinthians? They all have the truth, but they're all tailored to a different audience. He's talking different stuff that relates to them in a certain way, in ways that they can understand. You know, it's no different here as we hear. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Here is Paul emphasizing how he lives his life for the benefit of those around him. He's thinking about those people that he interacts with. He's willing to put himself aside and become what? A slave. You know, is this someone that is only focused on himself? Is this a person that's isolated? No. He's interacting with the people in his life, sharing the gospel message, becoming a slave to these people so that he can share the gospel. And you think about his sacrifice that Paul made. You know, there were many times where he was whipped one less from the point of death. He, there was many times where he was stoned or beaten or imprisoned or thrown out of the city almost dead. Was that easy? Were those conversations easy? No, they were not. You know, would it have been easier to find some island and, you know, just hide away there? Not interacting with anyone? <laughs> Most certainly it would have. But that's not what God called him to do. He didn't call him to be isolated. He, did call, he didn't call him not to be connected to the world. No, he called him to go out into the world to proclaim Jesus. To proclaim that salvation that people needed to know. Again, you know, how, how does Paul tackle this? How does Paul tackle these relationships? He says this, to the Jews, I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak, to win the weak. So how might we look at this? Maybe we look at it from the pastor's perspective. Maybe it's an easy one. You know, so you have the pastor, right? And you imagine, you know, <laughs> if I dressed up like a big businessman from New York and I, I, I conversed in all of those, you know, that kind of dialogue and stuff like that, and I, I, I'm standing before you, or if I started interacting in that way in our town, how well that, would that work? <laughs> I think you'd get some Wisconsin hospitality, and people would still kind of listen to you, right? But essentially, they'd be like not really listening to you. Uh, you know, or if I had a different culture and I was from a different background and I came here and I tried to use that culture here, it would feel kind of abrasive. People might still welcome you, right? They might say, yeah, you know, we're glad you're in our, our community and stuff, but it might be hard to communicate with others with kind of a different cultural background. Uh, I, I think there, there could be other ways to look at this too, you know, kind of becoming these things for people. Uh, one example I'm thinking of, like a week or two ago, you know, I, I started working on a certain test and 
when I interact with my members, I hear about their hunting expeditions and stuff like that, and, you know, certain seasons, and I, I have tried to get into it in a certain sense of trying to communicate with our members because, I, A, I think it's interesting, but also to have kind of relationships with them. You know, my family doesn't come from a hunting family at all. Um, I, I've never gone out actually hunting and, and shot something I, by myself I, in that way, I guess. But a, a couple of weeks ago, I, I took my hunter safety course, and I, I, I passed it on my first try. Um, was it easy? I guess so. <laughs> did it take time? It did, right? But why did I do it? Was it because my family owns a bunch of land that I can go hunting on? No. Is it because my, my family goes out on Thanksgiving week and goes go hunting? No. Uh, I have no, none of those things. I, I do it because I, I, I need to go hunting and want to go hunting with my, my members. Maybe this is a shameless plug right now. <laughs> but essentially, you know, why did I do that? Because I want to know the hobbies and things that my members care about. And you think about this, it could be a variety of different things. It doesn't necessarily have to be hunting, right? But it's something that our congregation and many of our members are into. But imagine if I went to another congregation where they, they were not big fans of, of hunting. You know, would I do it then? I, I probably wouldn't. Because I, I wouldn't want to cause an issue because I'm trying to become part of this group, right? I'm trying to have the opportunity to share Jesus with them. But if they said it was a sin, then maybe I would do it because God doesn't say you can't go hunting, right? You know, sometimes in love, you sometimes have to correct people like that, but that takes a lot of judgment call. That takes a lot of love. That takes a lot of self-sacrifice. Or maybe I can go to someone's house and have a beer at their table. But if I go to another family's house, they have a problem with drinking and stuff, and so they don't even have it in their house. So will I have a, a beverage with that family? No, right? You, you serve the people that you're with. You, you don't want to have earthly things become a barrier to those that you serve. And so you think of Paul in his settings, right? What did he do? Paul became a Jew, to become a Jew, essentially. Or he, he became a Jew to win the Jews. Um, essentially, a pastor wants to smell like his sheep. He, he, he wants to know, have the sheep know that he cares about them. So again, it doesn't matter for, for Paul if it was the Jews, he wanted to smell like a Jew. When, when it was the Greeks, he wanted to smell like a Greek. When it was the weak, he wanted to smell like the weak. To do what? To win them over, to share that gospel message, to have them open their, their, their lives so that he has the opportunity to share Jesus with them. Again, is this easy? No. Because you might have to deny yourself in the proclamation of, of Jesus. You think of, of kind of communicating. Again, it takes time and effort to, to do this, and you have to be patient. You have to be willing to kind of work through those things, right? Sometimes we mess up in our conversations with people, and sometimes you learn. And if you can have those conversations, you can forgive each other and grow, right? Well, God wants us to have these conversations with other people. He wants us to talk about Jesus with those that are in our lives. He doesn't want us to live in some kind of little bubble uh, detached from him. He wants us to interact with other people in many ways. And maybe in some ways it might look like this. It might be having the tough conversation with a son or daughter who's living with a spouse. It might mean having the tough conversation with a parent who is on their deathbed and doesn't believe in Jesus yet. It might mean having those tough conversations with, with those that are around you to say Jesus is everything and we don't know when Jesus is coming. You know? or, or, or maybe it might mean there are times in our lives when we really haven't thought about the other person's faith, you know, where they are in their faith. Are they, are they weak in their faith? Are they struggling in their faith? 
right? You know, maybe we, we, we've kind of forgotten about that, and so maybe we've used our words to lash out because this is what we desire, this is what we envision for our life and what we envision for other people's lives, you know? And often it maybe not even has anything to do with spiritual things, but just more personal things. You know, we, we don't want to get stuff in the way uh, of sharing Jesus. We want that truth to be proclaimed to those around us. And yes, we struggle. Yes, we fail. There are times when we've had these conversations and we're like, I wish I would have said something different. I wish I would have said something better. I, I wish I would have said something at all. You know, we struggle at having relationships. We struggle at communicating because we're self-centered. We're focused on ourselves. We don't often focus on God because we're, we're focused on this world. We, we don't focus on other people because we're focused on what we're getting or what we're going through versus what other people are going through. You know, Lord, have mercy on us when we haven't loved our Lord and prioritized that relationship with him. Lord, forgive us when we haven't prioritized the relationship of others for the sake of their salvation and their eternal life. You know, think about what Jesus did, right? In our gospel reading, we had two disciples go up to Jesus and say, Lord, can we sit at your, your left and your right? They're focused on themselves. And Jesus corrects them and says, that's not for me to give, so to speak, and that, that those spots are not for you, you know? But I think what is interesting, what follows that dialogue is what Jesus says uh, after that. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant. With James and John, Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So if we're looking at Jesus' life and how he lived, how did he live? What does his relationships look like? Well, he sacrificed himself for the people, the people that were around him. Think of all the times that he healed the sick and, and, and you know, raised the dead and all these different things that he was doing, all these different miracles. And how often do you think he might have been kind of tired, <laughs> that he wanted some alone time, but he sacrificed himself for the people to make sure that they saw their Savior, that they heard the voice of their Lord. And what a blessing it is that this Lord and Savior sacrificed himself on the cross for us because he values relationships. He values the relationship that he has with his people, no matter how sinful they are. Think about what he said on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Here are, is the quote-unquote, appears to be the enemy, those who are killing him, and what does he do? He's forgiving them. Not just with words, but also with actions. He's forgiving their sins so that he could, God willing, have a relationship with them. He wants a relationship with you, and so he forgives your sin and my sin. He forgives the sin of the whole world, no matter how evil they are, or how evil they, they're living their lives. He still desires to have a relationship with his human creatures, his, his creation, right? And it hurts God and it pains him when his creation rebels against him and wants nothing to do with him. You, you can imagine the sorrow that is in his heart when he has to finally cast those unbelievers to hell. It's not something he wants to do because, again, he wants a relationship with them. He's trying to reach out in different ways to communicate this truth. And the reality is, he, he might be using this truth to use you, right? To proclaim that word to those that are in your life. He may be using you to share Jesus with that person who is struggling or lost, 
to share that message of salvation with maybe you accidentally run into sometimes, right? This is the word of God that we cherish. This is the relationship that we have. And then Paul concludes with this idea. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Everything we do is focused on serving the Lord. Everything we do is focused on those relationships. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. It may mean casting aside some extra time, even though you feel like you don't have it, to give it to someone else, a lending ear. It may mean to say again those hard things that need to be said because you want those people, those that you love, in heaven. You you don't want to sacrifice this kind of hardship and not see your loved one in heaven. You know, we want those relationships also in heaven. We had a funeral this morning for Joanne Helmley. Her, her husband passed away uh, the first year that I was here. He was my first funeral. And so now both of them are in heaven. The relationship, in a certain sense, in a heavenly way, continues, but their relationship with God continues. And it's there, right? Uh, something that my dad said at uh, their anniversary, and they had this big picture of our en- entire family on the wall. He said, one thing that God gives you that you can take out of this world is your family. You can't bring your clothes, you can't bring your home, you can't bring your boat, you can't bring your gun, no matter, you can't bring any earthly things. But the thing that you can bring to you, with you in heaven is your family, those relationships. And how amazing would that be to praise your God along with the other angels, with all the other people that share in the faith in that relationship, praising your Lord now and forever. There is no greater thing than that. That is what we long for. That is what we yearn. And we're willing to sacrifice everything to save the lost, to save the weak, to save the Jew, to save the Gentile. But we never compromise that truth. That word is always truth. Let us pray for the Spirit's help as we do these things out of love. Dear Heavenly Father, you created us to be social people. You have commanded us to love you and love those around us. Forgive us when we have put ourselves first or the the comforts of our lives before serving others in love. We ask that you send your spirit to us to give us strength and patience to work with those in our lives, especially those different from us. Help us to share Jesus' message. Help us to share the salvation we, we have no matter their background, no matter if they vote blue or red, no matter if they're from a city or or the country. Use your spirit to work through the words and actions we use to create faith in the hearts of these people so more may be won back to you. Let us rejoice every time you take hold of another person through faith. Let us use the time you have given us faithfully before our king returns on that last day. So all those who have called to your own will be brought to the heavenly home. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join in confessing our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, God, and God of grace and truth, we thank you for the truth that you have given us. Help us share it willingly. Help us share it with all our heart. Help us share it with all those people that are, are in our lives because we do not know the, the day or hour of Jesus' return. Let us work w- with diligence. Let us work with quickness. May your Spirit bless the work that these people do in your name, that it may be glorified always, now and forever. Amen. And we join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and keep us. Amen. You may be seated. We join in singing our closing hymn. Good evening. evening. Special welcome to our guests and visitors. Always a pleasure to worship with you. Uh, Just a couple of announcements. Um, We'll have our congregational meeting on October the 27th. Uh, We'll have elections there. Um, The the congregation is also looking at getting a generator for the parsonage. Um, Down our road, um, we have these electric poles and then right next to them, someone thought it was wise to put these giant trees that are really skinny, and whenever it snows or is windy, blows them down, and we often are without powder power. Um, this happens at least once or twice a year. 
Um, so the, the, car, uh, the leaders are looking to have um, something put in, and uh, they're kind of having discussions about it right now, but just kind of letting you know that's what they're looking to do. Um, we're also having a transfer of members. We've had a lot of members transfer in. We had 141 member uh, people worship with us last week. You know, just like, yeah, what a blessing it is to give praise to God that we get to serve so many people, uh, the, the truth of, of his word. Um, in the mailbox, you have the third quarter financial statement that is available for you. Um, again, we had a funeral for Joanne Helmley this morning. Um, we had a bunch of people that were helping out with kind of serving coffee and snacks, and I thank them for that. We had the, the funeral at 12, and then we had the committal, and I uh, kind of got ready for tonight again. Um, so I'm ready to kick up my feet and <laughs> go to bed. Uh, I have a devotion tomorrow at St. Uh, John's um, at their school, too. So um, Also, the, there's Reformation services. I'm trying to remember. Maybe you saw it on the slides there. They were kind of passing by. Um, there's two of them. I'm kind of gear, uh, sending people to both, you know, because I don't know if, if you want to go up to Trinity Marinette, that's at 2 o'clock. If you want to go to St. Paul's in Green Bay, I believe that was at 4 o'clock. Yeah, 4 o'clock. Um, so um, if that is something you are, are interested in, know that those are available on that Sunday, the October uh, 27th. Uh, if you'd like more information about it, feel free to contact me and I can kind of point you to one of those. I believe that's everything for, for today. We have the teen event on Saturday and that's coming up. So if any more teens would like to come, um, please let me know. Uh, it's not too late to sign up. So God's blessing on the rest of your week and have a nice week.